Hi there, I'm your host, Clive Sirkin, and welcome to the Unstuck Podcast, where we're on a journey to help you get control of your work environment, get yourself unstuck, and perform to your full potential. Hey there, today's guest is Dr. Marcus Collins, good old friend of mine, as in long time, not he's old. Um, Marcus uh, runs the social practice of donor. He is a faculty member of the Ross School of Business. He's the co-director of the Yaffe Digital Media Initiative uh, and just an all around super cool, good guy who I've had the joy of knowing for, I think, a long time. He's a young guy. So Marcus, welcome. Thanks so much for, for making the time to talk with us. It's always a pleasure, Clive. Thanks for having me. Um, so this podcast is about unstuck, right? people getting unstuck, companies getting unstuck, and getting unstuck in terms of ideas. And, you know, at the heart of getting unstuck is having insight. And you are mm-hmm. the king of insight, right? So the the essence of a planner, and I, I have to say, I hope you, you, you view yourself as a planner, but at the heart of getting unstuck is insight. And you actually talk about yourself, or you did at one point, because it stuck with me for a long time, as being a translator of human behavior. What do you mean by that? Talk to me, because I, I love oh, that. Yeah. I got a couple of, you got some killer concepts, so we're going to go through a few of them. But <laughs> let, let's start with translator of a human behavior. Yeah, I think it starts with the, the earlier point about insights. You know, what, what are insights? Insights is just converting facts into meaning, right? It's taking what we see and translating them into something meaningful for people who are receiving it meaningful for the people who are experiencing the phenomenon and then meaningful for the people who might use it. So as strategists, right? So like, you know, I used to be a donor now I'm at Wyden Kennedy, head of strategy in, in New York city. And so we talk a lot about like, you know, what are the insights that we're trying to extract here? What we're trying to get at is what is the meaning that we're trying to extract? So by and large, as strategists, our jobs are to translate what we observe into meaning into something that is meaningful. Me as an academic at, at Ross, you know, when, when I'm doing research, you know, as a qualitative researcher, we always say that, you know, we are the research instrument. Like we are the one who are doing the interpretation, the interpreting, the, the translating. So as marketers whose job is to influence behavior, we're constantly looking at what is observable in the phenomenal world translating that into something meaningful so that we might be able to create catalysts that excite people to adopt behavior. So I'm just kind of translating human behavior in, in that way from what I observe to what it means and taking what I mean, what it means into something that gets people to move. And that, that I love that because ultimately I think we all as marketers are true are really um, students of the human mind on the human condition and the human behavior and ultimately whether we like it or not we're in we're in the world of commerce and so mm-hmm. we're you know we're, we're students of, of behavioral economics but you you talk about cultural contagion and that's something else that also resonated with me which is you can have great insights you can translate it well but ultimately you're trying to create a movement a behavior a a commercial outcome that yeah. leaves the person who puts the hand in the pocket feeling great about putting the hand in the pocket is that, is that was that intentional? Like, talk about cultural contagion. Yeah, you know, so so uh, throughout my my years in the the advertising world, you know, we talk a lot about culture, and I realized that I didn't know what culture really was. I mean, it had like these abstractions of what it what it was and what it is because it is esoteric by, by its very nature. But I didn't have like language to 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 really operationalize it. Um, and this is at a time when marketers were just enamored with virality, everything going viral. Like this, like 2011, 2012, yeah. virality was the thing. So I'm like, I'm interrogating this idea of culture, I'm trying to understand what it really is and how to operationalize it while also living in this world where virality is like the most important thing ever. Um, and what I realized is that virality is, is a, is a happening or it's an occurrence that doesn't really impact business the way that we want. And here's how I got to this. And and just let me kind of detour for a minute here. I'm thinking about the movie Avatar. But at the time, it was the highest grossing movie ever at the time. One would say that Avatar has gone viral, right? It's been seen so many times the world over, right? Um, But I seen Avatar three times, but couldn't remember the lead character's name. 
which is just odd for me. I was like, I knew the, the character's name, but I, I didn't, I, did, I knew the actor rather, but I didn't know the character's name after seeing it so many times. And then I asked people who I know saw it as well, and they couldn't remember it either. But then I thought about the movie Frozen, which I hadn't seen at the time, but I knew the lead character's name. I knew the plot. I knew the words to let it go. I mean, I'd seen let it go in my head when someone said let it go without even seeing the movie. When I realized that, oh, getting seen a lot isn't enough. It's how do these things get adopted into our way of life, our program for everyday living, which is what essentially culture is, right? Culture is the system of systems that make up our identity, the beliefs and ideologies that we hold, the behaviors that we take on that is normative to what it means to subscribe by a cultural label, i.e. the artifacts we don, the behaviors that, that we take on, the language that we use, and then how we express it through cultural product, right? In, uh, Raymond Williams says that, Culture is the, is the realized signifying system. And he's smarter than me. So I say culture is the realized meaning-making system. It's the way by which we make meaning. So when we talk about cultural contagion, we mean the spread of things from person to person, which is virality, but the spread of things from person to person that not just spreads, but takes hold into our cultural practice. It becomes the language that we use, the behaviors that we take on, and the artifacts that we don. And that's way more powerful then things just going viral. So my research as a as an academic and my work as a practitioner have focused in on how do things propagate from person to person and become adopted within the cultural practice of a community of people. I, I mean, I couldn't agree with you more. And it's like, I, I hesitate to go down this path because we'll never get out of this rat hole. But, you know, <laughs> you know, I, I get hysterical about this, but it's like, and by the way, um, yeah, I, I dated myself because I talked about your role at Donor and I know you're at Wyden. Wyden, I've always been in awe of Wyden. And the reason I have, and there's a handful of agencies that I've always been in awe of, and it's the agencies that have endured. And the reason they've endured is not because they're world-class at craft, mm-hmm. which they are, that, but that's, that's not the deal. They're world-class because they do the things you just talked about, which is at the heart of the craft, at the heart of a wonderfully produced and directed and a piece of work, whatever it is, digital, analog, it doesn't matter to me, is a powerful idea that has at its heart um, a deep, deep understanding that resonates and takes hold in the way that you just described it. And it's because, it's you know, we're heading, apparently can is coming up. Um, and it's like, I always get like torn there because it's like, at times it's a bit of a self-indulgent sort of celebration of, you know, um, but at its very best, it is an opportunity to talk about how to create mm-hmm. deep, deep, deep impact in the way that you talked about it. That's right. And, 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 and I think you're right. I mean, this is something that you and I have always bonded over, like understanding people, like the, look at the behavioral economics, the psychology, the sociology, the anthropology, because to your point, the, the better we understand people, the better the work becomes. Like the better, the more we understand the underlying physics of human behavior, why we do what we do, why we behave the way we behave, the more likely we are to create creative product, creative work that gets people to adopt behavior. And if we're not doing that, then we're just creating beautiful Fabergé eggs. Right. Well, and and, pieces of, of art that's not driven for commerce. Right. And 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 that's the point. Like we have to unabashedly embrace and be, fall in love with the fact that we're in the business of commerce. That's right. No, that's right. That doesn't mean be a hack, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's right. right. Yeah. Th- that's a binary construct. It's like we're in the business of getting people to put their hand in the pocket. Now, we can mm-hmm. do it two different ways. We can be a hack or we can create real meaning. Yes. That right. ha- and, and my deal is, I always said, equity, brand equity, is a consequential outcome of making someone feel really good about giving you their money. That's right. And right. the way to do it is to give them meaning when they give you your money. That's like, and sometimes I feel like we sort of veer off and get self-absorbed with the craft right. <laughs> as opposed yeah. to deep idea. And, and, and the, the other part of it is, um, which you've heard me rant and rave about, is it's like I always, someone said this to me, it's not my line, but it's like we think people think more than they think, right? Mm. It's like, <laughs> that's great. you know, like I, I was, I grew up in the old school. It was like think, feel, do. And we know that's bullshit, yeah. right? It's feel, do, yeah. think, right? That's, right, that's right. why you have the concept of post-rationalization. And so everything that we do to get people 
to feel good about what we made them do. And it sounds a little bad to say made them do, inspired them to do, right? There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, is to give them meaning so they can post-rationalize it and have them fit inside their value system. It is, is my that, view. It, it is so powerful. I mean, what is the, the, the most consequential question of humanity? What's the meaning of life? I mean, we're constantly looking for meaning. We're meaning-making machines. We're just constantly looking for what does it mean, translating, interpreting things so that it fits into our worldview, which is demarcated and shaped by our sociocultural subscription, right? These things are, are, are one and the same. In fact, you know, I, I love the way you talked about brand, you know, brand equity, you know, it, it by its very nature is informed by the meaning that people give. I mean, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I... I the definition I use for 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 brand is that brand is a signifier that conjures up thoughts and feelings with regards to a company, a product, a person, institution, organization. It's a signifier. It means something, and that meaning it activates these affects and cognitions that in, that that influences people to act, to move, whether it's to buy, to vote, to 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 watch, to subscribe, to share, to to take on action, which is what our job is as as, as marketers. And the better we understand people, the better we'll be at doing that thing. No doubt. And let, perfect segue, because, I mean, you know that I'm, I'm going here. Um, <laughs> so one of my all-time favorite things that I, that I spend time on is your Check the Rhyme. And so oh, yeah. um, I want to talk about the the thinking behind check the rhyme because i think it's 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 just terrific i mean part of the study of the human condition is to go and look in places that you wouldn't typically look that's right because that's there's right. deep meaning buried and hidden in plain sight we just it don't does. look there and right. so talk about check the rhyme like the the logic and the thinking and how it happened and then i wanted to i want to talk about one that that i keep thinking about and then i'd okay. love you to throw in a few that you your faves because this is a big big opportunity yeah, so so check the rhyme uh, was born out of my uh, my doctoral dissertation. So I studied uh, social contagion, like we talked about earlier, virality, but really social contagion is a, it's a different phenomenon. But I studied social contagion within the cultural context of hip hop, and I knew I wanted to study how things spread. And then I was all about, I mean, I'm I'm of the hip hop generation. I'm a huge hip hop fan, particularly uh, like you know Tribe Called Quest, Native Tongue. Um, so I knew I, I wanted these two worlds to come together in my research because I feel like there was just just a, a, a ripe opportunity there. And as I went through the literature, I realized that hip hop was just woefully understudied in the marketing and man marketing and business management literature, like unbelievably under under researched. And I remember talking to some of my professors while I was I went I went to get my my doctorate at, at Temple, talking to some of my my professors. And some of them were like, well, why would you want to study hip hop? Like that's like that phenomenon is kind of already done. And, then, and it, it, no, no one really got it right away until I was talking to my my chair who actually chaired my my, my, dis my dissertation. You know, I asked her, you know, she was like, well, I, you know, this 10 years ago, maybe you studied it. That could be cool. And I was like, well, what kind of headphones does your 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 kid wear? And she's like, oh, Beats by Dre. Of course. I was like, why, why do you think that is? <laughs> and then she thought she's like. Oh man, you got to study that. I was like, exactly, <laughs> exactly, right? We know Bose is demonstrably better product, but Beats by Dre dominated the, the 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 headphone category, especially over the year before AirPods came out. So we realized that hip hop has this unbelievable, disproportionate influence on commerce, something that marketers hasn't tapped into to to very well. And I thought, like, and if you look at hip hop lyrics, like these guys have been preaching the gospel about marketing theory like way before practitioners like us had been leveraging it from, from Jay-Z to, to Kanye West, to, to K-Dot, to, to, uh, to, to rock him, like KRS one, like these guys have been using colloquial language to communicate marketing theory. And I was like, Oh, let's give these dudes, let's give them the flowers they deserve. Like let's, let's give them the professorial props that, that, that they deserve. So I decided to, to make a, a, a series called check the rhyme where I take hip hop lyrics and extract marketing insights from them to give these guys the the, the respect that's due. Well, I would just say, if you're in the business, if you're a planner, if you're a creative, if you're a account person, uh, you need to go and read these. 
Um, and you'll tell people how to get there. But the one, the one that resonated with me, maybe just because at the time when I was reading it, but um, I think it was back in February of twenty or March of twenty. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I know because I was I was sitting in, uh, in the middle of nowhere. But um, <laughs> you talked about the line. There was a there was a, a line in in K dot song. I think it was humble, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there was something to the fact of. I'm sick and tired of the Photoshop. Show me something natural like an Afro and Richard Pryor and yeah. um, something natural like bodies with stretch marks. I, I'm that's sure right. I butchered the lines, but some well, version it. of you that. You had it right. You had it right. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. And, and you took that to authenticity. So let's do that one, and then I'd love you to pick the one that you love. But that Absolutely. one sort of – that just nailed it for me, and it had me oh, going. Thank you. So, yeah, so, I mean, like what, what Kendrick Lamar is lamenting is this notion of wanting realness and marketers use the language of, is it authentic? Is the brand authentic? Would this be authentic for the brand? And while we use that vernacular, that jargon, we don't really have an operationalized Rosetta stone to really carve out things that are authentic, right? You ask people what authenticity is and they'll go, uh, it's being real, being whatever. Like, well, no, no, no. Like you can't operationalize real. Like let's, let's cast some language to it. And so I borrowed, uh, from the literature of um, a, a scholar, authenticity scholar named David Brown Jr., who talks about authenticity as transcending context, that no matter the context, the person, the entity, the organization, the being is themselves. And that happens on the continuum. It's not a binary thing. It's like either you are or you aren't because we, you know, Clive five years ago is not the Clive today. Hopefully you have evolved, yeah, right? Thank so, goodness. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Same here, right? So because we evolve, it's on a continuum. However, the person I am today, no matter the context, I show up as Marcus or I show up as who who I am uh, in, in that moment in my life. And it's like, oh, well, that becomes really powerful for a brand because you ask ourselves, well, who are we? What do we believe? How do we see the world? What is our conviction? And because of that conviction, we then behave accordingly. Because when we don't, people go, oh, man, I'm so sick and tired of the Photoshop. Show me something natural like an Afro and Richard Pryor. Like, show me the real. And if marketers start thinking that way, then we kind of get out of this, like, th- 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 this, this, this discourse about, is it real for the brand? Should the brand be doing this? And we can ask, is it true? Regardless of the context, is it true? And then we can identify whether we should talk about a particular topic or stay away, whether we should jump into, you know, uh, this social cause or we should keep our mouths shut, right? Because we don't have authority to be within, to, to participate in that dialogue because it is not who we are. Right. And there's, there's an interesting tension there because a lot of brands feel compelled to attach themselves to something for good reason, like they're well intentioned, right? It's it's it, this is a pure decision. Like we should do something. Now That's sometimes right. there's a little we should do something because it will be good for us. Let's just, let's take the high road. They're doing it because they think it's a good thing, and it it isn't right because yeah. it isn't true. That's it, right. I'm sure you see a lot of that. Like, what's your view? Because there's there's a bit like do you, do you want to do something good or do you want to do something true? And all those yeah. is there a real tension there, right? I love that. It just the right or do something because it's true. Like some people say, like, you know, we should speak out on this because, you know, everyone's talking about it. As opposed to we should speak out on this because we can't help ourselves but talk about it. Like I can't hold my peace. That's just how 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 excited I am about it or how aggravated I am about it or how vexed I am about it. Because of the conviction that I have, I have to say something, even if it means losing customers. Right. Even if it means people burning their Nikes, right? Even if it means people saying, I'm no longer going to eat, I'm no longer going to eat Ben and Jerry's ice cream. It's like, well, that's fine. But we're so convicted about it because that's who we are. Regardless of the context, they show up the way they are. And I think that's really powerful. Right. Although, and I, I just, I would say, because one of those examples, and I don't want to go, um, you have to be consistent, right? Oh, yeah. Part of being yeah. true is being consistent. So jump in on something because you feel it's the right thing to say. Versus I am convicted about this and I'm consistently right. convicted about this across all the data points. And in one of those instances, they got killed because they weren't consistent, right? <laughs> yeah. Pick, pick, I don't want to lead the witness because I, I, I'd love you to pick one that you like. Um, oh. I, I, I'm, not, I'm hoping it's the one I want you to like. 
Uh, oh, but, I, I tell you the one that I love. I mean, I I, I love Patagonia. Oh, okay. I, I love Patagonia. I mean, Patagonia is their conviction yeah. is very very clear. Yeah. You know, no matter what's going on, they're going to be Patagonia. Like Patagonia is going to Patagonia because of how they see the world. Like you know, Yvonne Schnarr talks about like climbing clean, like you know, reducing the impact of uh of, of our of our fingerprints on on the earth and everything the brand is about communicates that. It signals that whether it's the products that they make, the 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 kind of business that they do from a B two B perspective, and where they spend their money, right? Like, and so when Patagonia speaks up, it's because they're convicted, not because it is in vogue. Well, I I love that because they do it, they do it in the tone of which they do it, in part because they, it's true, right? To yeah, the brand. exactly. They don't get up on a soapbox. Yeah, they don't lecture. That's they don't right. judge. They just do. That's right. um, and that for me is a big part of authenticity because I think a number of the brands that sort of get up on a soapbox and start wagging the finger and lecturing <laughs> um, are a little self-indulgent. So, uh, and that's when people I, go check the receipts. They go, right. mm, let me see what this is all about. So uh, actually, yeah, and then that's when where, that's where people go, nah, you're not real. Yeah. Right, right. Um, let's pick one more. Check the okay. rhyme. I'd say my favorite, not my favorite, this is one of my favorites. Uh, it has to come from Kanye West, All Falls Down. <laughs> um, and he says, and I spend 400 bucks on this just to be like, you ain't up on this. And I love that because this is essentially what Pierre Bourdieu wrote when he talked about social capital or cultural capital, rather, social ca cultural capital coming out of social capital. Um, and it's this idea that we consume as a way to signal our identity in an effort to increase our position in the stratified uh, social hierarchy so that we get access to financial capital, right? You know, he breaks down to three into three buckets. Uh, Bordeaux says that there is uh, embodied uh, cultural capital, which is like the skills that we have. Think about, you know, uh, ability to play, play music, uh, play an instrument, um, our, our, our our vocabulary, things that we that we acquire. Um, there's a, there's objectified cultural capital, which is the products that we buy, right? If I'm driving, you know, a, a, a Maybach, you go, oh, that dude must be living it, right? right, right. I'm signaling my, where I am in the social, in the social stratified social hierarchy, right? I'm willing to spend the premium just to project my identity, and then there's institutionalized Institutional. cultural capital which are the, the the organizations that we're a part of, the companies we work for, the schools we went to, ways to signal who we are in the world. And we do these things to increase our level, decrease where we are on, on in the social hierarchy and also get access to, to more capital, economic capital in this way. I mean, like Kanye West took like this really dense idea that Bordeaux is like famous for for providing in, 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 in very, you know, it's very rigorous academic language and put in the most, digestible way and i spent 400 bucks on this yeah. just to be like you ain't up on this that's amazing i love hip hop for that i love it for that it's a great line how do uh, how do people uh because there's going to be a bunch of people emailing me and texting me going how do i get to to, to see more of this where, where do we go you can go to my website mark to the c.com m-a-r-c-t-o-t-h-e-c.com uh, the, the, the blogs are there. There's also a video format where you can, uh, catch me on Instagram, um, at mark to the C.com. Hey, let me tell mark you, this video is good because this is a good looking man. You want to watch him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, we, I, we're getting closer to time. I want to pivot and talk about two things that have got nothing to do. Well, one got slightly something to do with who you, what you do for a living, but the dirty secret that I know is that you studied, I think I know, material science engineering as an undergrad. That's How true. in the hell did you get from <laughs> there to here? Okay. You know, it's easier to tell the story in the real view mirror than it is going forward. You know, I was, you know, I'm from Detroit, born and raised, and yeah. I'm a product of, of the city. And, you know, in the 90s, if you did well in math and science, then you most likely went to engineering, especially coming from Detroit. And I had been, in a lot of ways, sort of uh, reared to go in engineering. So when I graduated from high, sc high school, I went straight to University of Michigan to study materials because I thought that polymers were cool. Right? The idea that these carbon chains kind of connect and create these networks that become tangible things that we use, like our, our glasses or um, the, the cups that we drink out of, all these things that are built from plastics 
are just network chains. It's just super cool to me, at least uh, uh, theoretically. But when I got into the application of it in my in my in my learning in, in school, I was like, I don't think I want to do that. Like, I love the idea. It's interesting, but I don't want to do that. I really want to write music. My parents are like, you must be smoking crack if you think <laughs> that you're going to go to school at the University of Michigan to, to, to be a songwriter. And, you know, I, I get it. I get their their, their, their concern, their, their uh, conservatism. Uh, but when I graduated, I went straight to the music business. And By the way, sorry, it's not conservatism. It's deep love for their boy. There you go. There you go. There you go. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, exactly. It's they're being conservative because they 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 want to they want to protect me. I, appreciate it. I went to the music business. Um, did a startup that was like it did it did okay, uh, but it wasn't sustainable. So I went back to school to get my MBA. Went back to Michigan uh, to get my MBA and studied marketing because I thought that marketing was the most creative outlet of of, of business. And when I realized the thing that actually gravitated me to marketing, particularly marketing communications, was that it does. What music does and what what polymer chains do, they connect things that normally are disparate, right? Music does that. If you love Frank Ocean like I love Frank Ocean, you go, oh my goodness, yeah, Frank Ocean is the best. And we feel connected over a, a melody or a chord change or a rhythm or, or a lyric. And when marketers are at their best, we're creating cultural product that bring people together because they see the world similarly, just like carbon chains come together because they're electron files. And as I look at my career – from engineering to, to music and now in the world of, of marketing, you know, it's all based upon connecting things. And in this way, uh, just connecting people, which is why I think I missed in the engineering side that I loved in music that I get to do uh, as a marketer today. So I, and then also be in the classroom, connecting students to ideas to put them out in the world. It's, it's a, a, I feel very, very, very fortunate. It, and I think the people around you are, but that's, I mean, it's a brilliant story of not being stuck. Talk, <laughs> yeah. the, I want to finish um, because you talked about in the story, your connection to Detroit. And a, a couple of weeks ago, I had Michael Fasnacht, uh, an old, he is old, um, an old <laughs> <laughs> um, a great guy. You know, you know him, he's in the business and now he's the CMO amongst other things, the CMO for the city of Chicago. And we talked about Chicago and, you know, I love the city. Um, it's it's been my home since 1989. With a little uh, small time, I went away. But and and I have a deep affection for it. But I'm deeply troubled by mm. the sort of tale of two cities. Um, yeah. And it's tough because it, it, there's no easy. If there was an easy answer, we'd go get it. That's right. And then there's a parallel I would expect in in Detroit. It's been through you know its ups and downs and real tough times. And I know you love the city. Absolutely. So talk about you, how you think about it, because it's, it's easy to leave. Yeah. You know, especially yeah. a guy like you. I mean, you can go, you know, east, east coast, west coast. I mean, it's easy to walk away. What, and I did. Why? You know, and and I, you did for a while, correct? I did, yeah. I mean, I, I spent a stint in in uh, in the Bay, yep. mostly in, in New York. I did about eight years in New York City. Um, but, like, I'm a product of the city, and, and I feel a responsibility for to the city and for the city. And you're right. Like just like Chicago has its tale of two cities, Detroit is similar in nature. Where there's like the old Detroit and the new Detroit. And the old Detroit is kind of the bastion of the past. Has sort of weathered through, uh, you know, the, the riots uh, in the 1960s. You know, that's Detroit that I grew up in in in, in the 80s and in the, in the 90s. And then you know, with the very tough times, uh, with the bankruptcy and and like you know, just kind of the city sort of um, shedding itself of what it once was. And then you get an influx of people that bring new energy, which is awesome, which is great, right? But borders on gentrification. So how do you balance the, the history, the richness of the city with new energy that's all just kind of all, all invested and committed to just contributing to the great edifice that this place has been? And so for me, you know, I've, I've tried to be an evangelist and kind of a bridge to, to, to bring the two together um, in, in the best ways I know possible, which is helping tell the stories about the city, right? Helping telling the, the new Detroit about the old Detroit and tell the old Detroit about the intentionality of the new Detroit, because it's going to take the two in some fashion or another to be the Detroit that we all want, the Detroit that is, that is vibrant, the Detroit that is a manifestation of its spirit, resilience, grit, 
realness. It's about authenticity. You don't get much more authentic authentic than Detroit. But Detroit keeps it trill all the time. Um, and I love that about the city. Um, and, you know, I think about myself and my own, you know, my, my own sense of being authentic. It's always kind of tapping into the Detroit in me. It's like, uh, you got you to be who you are, man. Like, and yeah. I think that Detroit is going to be what it is. The idea is that how can we all old and new embrace what the city is and ultimately can be? It's, there's, I mean, there's so many parallels um, with the struggles in Chicago and, and, and in terms of the story of Chicago. I mean, yeah. then you, you could have put Chicago in a lot of that. <laughs> and right. um, I think there's a real opportunity for the, the creative community um, in the tech community, in the commercial community, to really dig in and become That's part right. of. And I think, I, you know, I, Michael and I were talking about is like, how do you roll up sleeves and do something? Yeah. Like, and give oxygen, because there are so many grassroots community people that, that are doing beautiful work, but they need to be amplified. That's right. And it's like, if you really give a damn about where you all get involved, in, you know, I, you may have met my friend Rich uh, Alipak, as we all live here, um, mm. which is a community-based uh, oh, yeah. organization. And it's the concept of we all live here tracks to every city and every community in every country um, starting at home. Yeah, I remember um, we all went and got coffee. He, he showed me the, the idea. And it's like, man, this this it, it's, it can start in Chicago, but there is a through line that exists in all these cities that are – that are, you know, changing. I mean, change is inevitable, right? And, you know, if we're all here, then we're all responsible and obligated to help the place be what it's supposed to be. Well, uh, now I think it's pretty darn clear why I, to the people who are listening, why I stalk you and why, <laughs> oh, I, <laughs> and, and why I get you on the phone as much as possible. <laughs> so listen, it's been such a joy to talk to you, sir. Um, we need to get you back. I got a couple other topics I'd love to to talk about more, but um, I would just say to everyone, Mark to the Sea, go and check it out. It's been a joy. Thanks for joining, my friend. Oh, my pleasure. Always, anytime. Love you. Appreciate doing it. it. Take care. This podcast was brought to you by Screen Dragon. We break down barriers, make workflow, and unlock talent. Visit ScreenDragon.com to see our software in action.